My name is Sinai Businek. I'm affiliated both with Bar Ilan University, where I teach at the Science, Technology and Society program. It's a graduate program. And at Haifa University, where I'm um, both part of the DESIR project um, run by the library, the university library. And I also teach in the new BSc program for digital humanities there. I'd like us to start um, by going a little bit into your own um, history as a scholar. Um, could you tell us a little bit about where you studied, what you studied, and, and kind of how you ended up where you are today? Well, my way as in the humanities um, has started in philosophy. I was a very dedicated philosophy undergraduate. Um, I actually had the option of choosing this Spe very special excellence program that I could join and I said no, all, all I want to do is philosophy and um, I live to regret it. <laughs> um, while I was working on my PhD I had this historical turn that where I actually worked in the library and I came in touch with, with books historical books, you know, the smell, the touch, the, the actual object. And I became fascinated with, with history and with the historical context of the concepts I was studying. So this was my historical turn in which I became more and more of a conceptual historian. That's, that was uh, the second phase of my um, scholarly life. And uh, I started, at some point I edited a journal uh, which is called the Contribution to the History of Concepts and I'm still, I still see myself as a conceptual historian in the, um, within and beyond the digital humanities sphere. Um, I didn't, I ended my PhD um, in conceptual history with a great frustration because I did get to know some databases, some digital interfaces where I could ask some questions and find data. But I realized that I'm, I'm very limited in what I can ask the data and that there are other ways of doing it uh, which were not, were not uh, available to me. And with this frustration I finished my dissertation and embarked on the postdoctoral degree and that was just before I learned what digital humanities was all about. And how did you learn what digital humanities is? What was your first encounter? Um, okay, I went to the conference, the American Historical Association um, conference to what I have to say was possibly the most boring session I ever participated in. Um, it was a session on, on editing scholarly journals. So it was really about journal editing with no thought about content or just, just basically sharing our frustrations. And the only reason I went to this conference, the history conference was um, to represent the journal and learn from it and but then I they had this special session that, in, in this conference that was called Digital Humanities and History the Future is Here and I was amazed by what I saw there I realized that everything that I needed in my dissertation is now possible and these are things that I can start learning and doing and I don't need some funds or some imaginary friend that will do it for me or um, some collaborations that will never work out. It's really something that within um, my capabilities and immediately I ran to the next um, <laughs> MacBook store um, and got myself my first smartphone and a laptop and I was really converted then. It was, I think it was seven years ago in winter 2011. 
today in Israel, when, when um, students are interested in digital humanities or digital culture in general, et cetera, what, what, are the, what are the educational offerings that are at their disposal? Where do they go to learn um, these new skills? So well, a few years ago, there was no way that a humanities student would be exposed to anything um, to do with digital humanities. The term itself was not known. And I think um, also the attitude was that digital methods were, had nothing to do with the humanities. And um, this is why the first thing I did was organizing um, a list of international workshops, bringing uh, people from abroad to teach um, things. We had a, a meeting on, on the Hebrew manuscript in the digital age, on historical network analysis, on other um, historical GIS, and, and many more meetups of people that were just interesting, interested in, in the subject. And a network was formed, and then we actually um, created an informal association uh, by the name of Ruach Digitalit, which is digital spirit or digital um, wind to uh, wind of change. Um, today we exist mainly in the form of a Facebook group, but uh, it's definitely a living network. Um, I think these, these workshops were the best um, way of, of actually bringing the word in, in the sense. Um, today the, the case is, is slightly better because we have actually a course in offering in each one of the universities. So we have, if I may name them, Yael Netzer and Eliezer Baumgarten have courses at Ben Gurion University of the Negev. We have both Yael, Amy Zinger teaching in Tel Aviv University, digital history. Um, um, I'm teaching and Gila Preboren uh, is also teaching digital humanities at Barilan University and we have the BSc program, so a whole program for uh, BSc, which is made of um, a double major, one in the humanities um, in a department of the student's choice and, and then um, also studies in um, information systems. So the graduates are, are like the dream hybrid digital humanities graduates that can really do everything, can code and can build and can plan and model and still have hum proper humanities education. Um, however, my real dream, uh, I have two dreams, two main dreams. One is the center, proper center where you can actually do projects in digital humanities. We still don't have that. And the other one is having a winter school for digital humanities where the entire community of great teachers and instructors that I became acquainted with can come in the winter uh, to give the same wonderful workshops that they offer in the summer in Europe and elsewhere. So this is what I still hope that I'll be able to establish at some point. You mentioned that you are a philosopher by training and that you did your PhD uh, before your own digital turn, so to speak. Um, how did you yourself develop the skills that you have today in this realm? Um, well, definitely the main source of learning was the international workshops. So I am a, a groupie of, um, of Elisabeth Bourg's uh, Leipzig Summer School. Um, I keep returning there whenever I can and there's still always, as, as you know very well, there's always more to learn and um, I'll continue learning. I think this is what is so exciting about digital humanities. It's a constant environment of learning. And um, one very special workshop was the Daria De'e organized workshop, then coordinated by Matt Manson. And um, Lars Wienecke and Mike Kestemont gave uh, an introduction to Python. That, that is also where I met Thomas Tasovac. And uh, 
the this workshop experience was so exciting that immediately I came home and and organized a hackathon at Haifa where I grabbed all the team and, and brought Mike and Matt and, and Toma to to uh, give workshops and, and do this hackathon, which I think to this day is one of the best um, events that I managed to, to organize. Of course, a big part of learning is when I'm um, in projects working is actually working. This is when, where you get your skills in, in the deepest way. And this is an environment that is still lacking for us. We are actually in, in an area that requires different kinds of training and different kinds of, of frameworks to, of learning. And um, I know that some people are the most, you know, talented and can really t learn on, the, on their own and they can you know, take a tutorial or even without a tutorial and, and, and learn. But I think the best thing, and this is also the best that Daria could do, is, is really work on learning environments. And you always learn best when you, when you sit side by side with someone and look at his or her screen and what they do. And, um, and preferably together, so when you work together. Uh, the question is how to organize this. So, so I would say definitely more workshop, workshop environments than tutorials. And then uh, not, again, tutorials are nice, but workshops are even nicer. And, um, and maybe more hackathon-like events. So, so places where people learn and, and contribute at the same time. Um, Yet another fantasy I have is of, uh, of this event, a kind of summer camp for digital humanities to, to high school kids that come to either transcribe or insert some, some material for training. So they give tagging input or something like that. And, and they get, first of all, they get the, I don't know, maybe some technical skills. Um, or, but maybe they're also being paid and being um, remunerated, remunerated for knowing, for for their uh, literacy, basically. I mean, being a humanities um, talented person or someone who has potential in the humanities mean, means that you're more literate than than others, and this is something that you can't have, you know. In our sad world, these these kids will become, you know, content slaves, you know, for for some media outlet here or there. But I mean, we should start thinking of way to remunerate literacy in the days where literacy is is actually going down. There is a research infrastructure, so there is no doubt that researchers um, are the top priority uh, for a research infrastructure. But what do you think is the role of a research infrastructure in shaping and educating the, the scholars of tomorrow? The role of infrastructures, I would say, should be maybe defined on the negative side of, of what an infrastructure should not do. Um, it should enable and, and expose knowledge and scholars to knowledge and scholars to each other. It should not, however, lock them inside. And this is one important thing about interfaces and infrastructures and platforms and any level of, of these tools that we build. Um, and now I'll, maybe I'll give a positive example, I'm thinking about the Wikidata query service, um, where they have this very friendly way of querying with the Wikidata collection um, by a very simple interface, but they always keep open the Sparkle window. So you'll have this view of what is actually behind, behind this interface. And then after a while, you realize I've seen this line before, and maybe it's, this is not gibberish. Maybe I can even play with it. 
And um, I know there are several tools that adopt this um, attitude, and I think it is very important, especially in the post-DOS Windows environment where people lost touch with, with code. I think also these hybrid tools that um, connect technologies are very important and promising. And here I'm thinking of the transcribus, read transcribus environment, because this is something that still puts um, a load on the humanist work, on, on the expert work of transcription, and um, still enables the training of the computer through, um, through models. And you can do this without delegating work to, OK, this will be done by the computer science people who have no knowledge of, of the content material. And this will be done by the, you know, the humanities scholar that um, um, can only really read the, this manuscript and, and transcribe them. No, I think this is the future is actually in something that um, connects the automatic learning artificial intelligence with human intelligence and human depth of depths of, of an understanding. Um, also the, the Pelagios tool that enables um, automatic and manual annotation. And uh, um, yeah, I think also there's um, a chain of articles that and, and blog posts that um, I read recently about how big data is cool, but it's the problem is the data that is, is uncertain. And people understand that you need some more expertise on the data production side. And I think these hybrid environments that connect both are, are really a big promise. What do you think Daria specifically could or should do um, differently or better in terms of training and education? Well, I wouldn't say that this is differently. I think it's more of things that I've seen Daria doing, uh, and that is workshop. I think as much as we strive to provide knowledge and skills locally, I think there is something that cannot be replaced in the international um, environment of, of an international workshop, because more than the skills that are taught, the, I think, the, um, the exchange and the, the exposure that you get um, to the international communities, to other learning environments, uh, is, is something that you should not replace with, um, you know, however expert a uh, local instructor can be. Yeah, and, and, and actually, you know, you mentioned the, the Leipzig Summer School, for instance, um, which we both attended at some point. It's, it's, it's fascinating how, I mean, a lot, it's very intense. A lot of learning happens in class. Uh, but one of the, the real values of such schools is precisely that, that conversations continue beyond class and that, that you know, things, um, mm, this, this kind of network development is something that doesn't happen in class only, but actually more, more importantly outside of the class. And, and so I, of course, I completely agree with you um, on this. Wait, um, as, as a renowned coffee lover, um, this is something that we learned also in my pre-digital network of conceptual history. Um, money that goes on coffee break is, is money well spent if you want to create a network. Thank you.